Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, before we get started, I wanted to go over our administrative details. First, slides. Slides are available for today's presentation on the in PDF format in the handout section of your webinar control panel to the right of your screen. And questions. We encourage you to submit questions using the box marked questions near the bottom of your control panel. Please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation. We'll have a separate question and answer period at the end of all of the presentations and we'll respond to any questions received at that time. Live captioning, access to live captioning is available during the program and there is an address on the screen for you to access live captioning. Webinar replay, a replay link and a transcript will be available early next week and will be posted to our website. Technical difficulties. Uh, if you experience any technical difficulties, please try the toll-free number on the screen or the link to the GoToWebinar. And today's agenda. So we have my boss, California State Treasurer Fiona Ma, and our keynote speech. And at the conclusion of her speech, we will be having a short um, question and answer with the treasurer. Next up will be Douglas Robinson of RCM Robinson Capital Management discussing economic trends. And then our investments division team with presentations regarding the PMIA from our director, Kristen, uh, assistant director, Jeff, credit manager, Tracy, and me with a little bit about LACE. And then finally, we'll have a question and answer period. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. First up is the treasurer. Treasurer Ma is the 34th state treasurer. She was elected on November 6, 2018 with more votes than any other candidate for treasurer in the state's history. The treasurer, as the state's primary banker, processes more than two trillion in payments with a, within a typical year, is trustee for more than 120 billion in outstanding debt, issued approximately 15 billion in general obligation and lease revenue bonds last fiscal year, and provides transparency and oversight for an investment portfolio of more than 179 billion approximately 35 billion of which are local government funds. Thank you for being here today, Treasurer Ma. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, and welcome to everyone to this late seminar. Uh, we are sorry that we are not able to meet in person again, but hopefully next year we will be able uh, to again um, network and see each other uh, in person virtually versus virtually. So a couple of uh, things. Um, number one, I got elected three years ago and time has really flown by and what a difference a year makes. Uh, the first year uh, I got elected in 2019, the state was facing a surplus of about $25 billion uh, to Rating agencies upgraded our bonds, and things were looking great. And then COVID hit, and the governor um, declared an executive order on my birthday, March 4th, 2020. I will always remember that uh, day in my mind. And we all were supposed to stay at home. Uh, we did that here in this office. Um, however, 100 of our team members still came to the office like many of you, I'm sure, to make sure that our essential functions uh, were still being handled and our bills were being paid. Uh, so I want to thank uh, the team that came in every single day to make sure that the program and the services that so many Californians depend on did continue uh, even during uh, COVID. So that year, March 2020, uh, we faced about a $40 billion uh, deficit. Many of us faced difficulties transitioning uh, to home life. Working from home for some of us is not as easy as it sounds, and some of us are very happy to be back in the office with some peace and quiet without dogs and doorbells uh, ringing all the time. We in uh, the Treasurer's Office, we continue to sell bonds. Uh, and to California's um, credit, investors are very, very supportive and excited whenever we come to market. We were one of the first states to come to market uh, in April of 2020, and we have continued 
to sell our bonds, both general obligation, revenue bonds, as well as for the CSU and uh, UC systems. Over the past three years, we've managed to save $4.9 billion over the next 20 years, thanks to rates and our ABLE team who have been looking for opportunities to refinance older bonds whenever possible. In 2020 also, LAFE offered special emergency accounts to agencies that received CARES Act funding. Some of you took advantage of that. Uh, that limit was also $75 million cap, similar to LAFE accounts, and we are still open and available uh, to investing your money. And remember, your money is safe in LAFE. And our ABLE team will be uh, talking more about uh, the details of your accounts and our investments over the past year. Then in January 2021, to my surprise and maybe to your surprise, we faced a $75 billion surplus. Like that totally blew my mind. And the surplus came from individual income taxes, corporate income taxes, and strong sales tax revenues. Even though we weren't going to work, we were all still buying online. And thanks to many of us who helped close that sales tax loophole, we are now collecting and remitting to local governments the local government sales tax uh, portion. Before that, it was only sales taxes for the state portion, but now when we order online, the state does collect both the state and the local uh, tax portions, which you probably all saw a difference uh, during this pandemic. And now the LAO is predicting another surplus for this coming fiscal year, anywhere from eight to $23 billion. So that is really good news, I think, for all of us. I know I had a hard time sleeping that first COVID year, worried about our finances and making sure we're all processing all the payments uh, as people, uh, taxpayers expected us to. And in our office, with our three divisions, investments, cash management, and public finance, we got on a call every morning at 8 a.m. It still continues uh, to this day where we are just checking in, making sure everything is good, our staff is healthy and safe, and I think that has really done a lot to uh, decrease my tension, uh, knowing that I have such an able team here at the State Treasurer's Office. Thanks to Jeff Unruh, uh, I also chair 13 active boards, commissions, and authorities. And again, because we were open for business every day, we continue to meet according to our agenda, and we never missed a day of work, never missed a deadline, all of our funding sources have gone out as expected, and I'm very, very proud of everybody who has stepped up uh, to make um, our job here at the Treasurer's Office um, uh, as easy as possible for the public. Even though we were here meeting physically at the Treasurer's Office, everyone else could meet virtually, our board members, our stakeholders, and I do think that it made a difference in opening up uh, access to government because now people could log on and participate at home on their computers instead of having to come up physically to Sacramento uh, to testify or to um, get a better view of what's going on. So I think that has been one of the, uh, you know, the, the great points of um, the highlights of COVID is this virtual world and being more accessible uh, to our taxpayers. We have a couple of new programs that we are very, very excited about. Uh, CDAC, our California Debt and Investment uh, Commission, just released four webinars. Uh, they are free to the public, and they're really focused for elected officials and others who are not perhaps as savvy uh, with what we do on a daily basis. Um, if you go to my newsletter, I hope that you have all signed up for my monthly newsletter. We talk a lot about uh, this uh, this new series um, coming out, and I just want to highlight on page three uh, that some of the 
issues that we are addressing is integration of long-range strategic and financial planning with debt issuance and management decisions, making debt structuring decisions that are equitable for current and future taxpayers, actively engaging in the policies and procedures for managing the risk of debt over the long term, practicing transparency in the decision-making process, and as fiduciaries, putting the interests of the agency and community above their own. So I hope that you will help socialize uh, these four initial uh, webinars to your bosses uh, and anyone else who may want to get a primer, a uh, better understanding of what some of these decisions that you are all making on a daily basis uh, and being able to just really educate them because a lot of the elected officials that get elected don't have the same financial uh, background that all of you do. And so hopefully uh, these uh, curriculum, this series of webinars will make your job a little bit easier as well, or they will be asking more questions of you. So um, we hope um, that uh, these um, uh, this series uh, will be a success, and we are going to be rolling out an additional five in the coming uh, months. And so total in total, I think we will have nine uh, webinars in this curriculum, and you will also be able to get some sort of credit, perhaps a certificate, uh, for also uh, going through the module. So stay tuned for that. In terms of housing, uh, I chair the California Tax Credit Allocation Committee and the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. And those are the two financing agencies that help build affordable housing here in the state of California. I'm very proud of our team. Uh, we have uh, um, approved more applications than ever in our state's history. Uh, we want to thank Governor Gavin Newsom for allocating $500 million in state low-income housing tax credits over the past three fiscal years. That has proved to be a game-changer for many projects that have had difficulty penciling over uh, the many years. And also, we've had help from the federal uh, level. Congressman Mike Thompson, as well as Congressman Jimmy Panetta, have been successful in getting us about $100 million each year in 9% disaster credits to help build housing faster in those areas that have been devastated by our wildfires. In our California School Financing Authority, which I chair, we also are getting more into the housing space. We issued our first ever bond to the Santa Rosa Community College, uh, Community College District to build student housing. We understand during this pandemic it's been very difficult for so many people and seeing community college students either sleeping in their cars, couch surfing, or even homeless has really been heartbreaking. And so I thank my CSFA team for being creative, thinking outside the box, and helping more young people uh, get through, um, through at least uh, community college by providing student housing. And we are looking for more available sites. So if you have community college colleges in your district that have excess land, please give us a call and we would be more than happy to work uh, with your team to provide more student and potentially more teacher housing. Scholarship 529 uh, is another uh, agency that I chair and that is really to help our next generation stay out of high student loan debt. Um, I came from the legislature and I continue to sponsor uh, legislation that relate to our office. And we had one piece of legislation that was carried by assembly member Chris Ward of San Diego and signed by the governor uh, that would now allow um, us to use our scholar share 529 for apprenticeship programs and also to pay back some of our old student loan debt in case we have extra money in that. And so we thank Assemblymember Chris Ward for carrying and sponsoring that legislation. In addition, another program to help low-income uh, children and also children succeed, uh, we have launched our CalKids program uh, through our Scholarship 529. Uh, agency as well. In 2019, 
there was a seed deposit of uh, $25 million from the state general fund to open up accounts for every newborn. Every newborn will now have their own account seeded with $25. That may not seem like a lot, but it really is trying to incentivize parents to continue to put more money into their kids' accounts once it is open. Um, recently, this year, uh, the governor and the legislature allocated $1.9 billion for an expansion of this program. For every first through 12th grader, they will also have an account open for $500 in their own name. And if they are homeless or a foster youth, they will have an additional $500 seated into their own account. So again, it's really to set it and forget it, and we hope that more parents are going to be contributing to these accounts so that they can help the success uh, for their uh, next generation. And lastly, uh, we are embarking on a big study uh, with the California Dream for All program. We are hoping by November of 2022, next fall, there will be an initiative that will create a fund, perhaps a general obligation fund up to $25 billion that will go to help low to moderate income taxpayers afford their first home. The state would like to create a fund to help pay the first time home buyer um, down payment. So down payment assistance, the state would create a fund. We would be a partner, a silent kind of partner for homeowners, and the funds would get paid back if the equity increases uh, in the home and or the taxpayers, the homeowners decide to sell their home. That um, Those would trigger repayment back to the state so that others could also receive a down payment assistance. So we are hoping that this is gonna be a game changer. We know that buying your home means building equity. That is the American dream. And I'm very, very excited for some of these endeavors that we are embarking here and others that we are going to, um, to continue to help taxpayers uh, become homeowners, afford higher education, save for their retirement. Uh, and I'm just very proud to be the treasurer here in the state of California. So I hope you enjoy your day. Thank you for participating. Thank you for trusting us with your money. And we look forward to seeing you in person very soon, or hopefully before next year's late conference. So thank you. Thank you, Treasurer Ma. And if you have at this time, do you have time to do a question and answer? Great, Lily, do we have any questions for the treasurer? Yes, we received one from registration, and they would like to know, will LAIF be increasing the maximum held at LAIF? We knew that was going to be the question. Uh, we are analyzing that right now. Uh, I spoke to the California Association of Treasurers and Tax Collectors uh, last month, and that was the first question that came from the recipient. So we are actively analyzing it, and we will get back to you. Great. Are there any other questions? No other questions. All right. Thank you, Treasurer Ma, for your Thank time you. today. Um, at this time, we next up is Economic Trends in the Negative Interest Rate World, presented by Douglas Robertson. Robinson, excuse me. And Mr. Robinson, please go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks, Christine. I'm trying to find the right button to push here. So, yeah, thank you very much. It is uh, it is fantastic to be a part of the LAFE's uh, here in such interesting times, to say the least. So, I, I always, when I do these things, I always have way too many slides and I've got to really kind of go through these kind of quickly, but it's so hard to throw out the ones that you've created. So if you bear with me, we're going to be covering a couple, I think, pretty important key points. So the direction of the economy, interest rates, Fed action, and I think the biggie that's going to run through most of this is inflation. 
Uh, we'll also take a look at uh, one of my most favorite subjects, uh, California demographics, and what current trends um, may hold for the state. So without further ado, what a, what a great place to start, but uh, at, at, at the bottom of things. And um, let's see here, I think I advanced a little bit too far. Oh, excuse me, I'm in control, so that's why it's going crazy. Um, right here at the beginning, uh, are actually the basement, uh, let's call it. So this chart shows us that uh, today we have very much a negative interest rate world. So what I did here is I just took the, the five-year treasury, um, adjusted it for inflation. So today's CPI year on year, which is from September of last year to September of this year, uh, CPI is running at 5.4%. So you deduct that from the nominal you know, yield to maturity rate, in this particular case, the five-year treasury, and it's a big minus number, so it's below 4%. And you can take this basically from any any fixed income instrument, you know, along the curve, and it's it, practically every one is gonna have a negative rate. So when you look at a chart like this, if you're an issuer, as Treasurer Maher was stating, as the state's going out into the marketplace and raising money, this is a time or a condition where you're, you're practically being paid uh, to issue. But if, if you're being paid to issue, the other side of the ledger is is on the buy side. So you know, you've got a great positive and potentially the, the buyer of that debt, well, uh, to, to you know, to each his own. So but what a wonderful time to issue is what that tells me. So we look around the we look around the world and um, this slide shows again the five year treasury. And I wanted to see that, uh, you know, where is the U.S. relative to, to other countries? So the, the U.S. really is today that shining light on top of the hill. We've got the highest rate uh, in, the, in the world for our, our, our treasury securities. It's only the U.K. on that side of the pond that is, um, that is above zero. But practically the entire eurozone is below zero. So there's only a few countries, uh, Italy, Greece, that have a, again, nominal rate. This is not adjusted for inflation, but below zero. So it's only Italy and Greece that have a, a positive a rate on their five-year debt. Um, so if you were to factor in inflation in Europe, which it just, it's running at 4.4%, that's their current number, yeah, you get into a, another deep, deep negative real rate of return. So when you look out, excuse me, when you look out across the globe, um, there's a little, a little less than 11 and a half trillion dollars is in dollars of securities below zero. Um, so when you look at a chart like this, which has uh, three specific tops of the maximum amount of debt in the world, um, it's somewhat encouraging that possibly we, we, we peaked out. This is what could be called a triple top. And as negative securities begin to fall, less of them, uh, you know, maybe the months, quarters ahead, we really got to watch this. But uh, I, I would suspect the world will come to its senses at some point, and the central banks around the world will will have allow the ship to right itself, and we'll go to some type of at least not all negative rates. Now, from the bad to the really, really good, uh, what a segue here. But when we look at uh, uh, GDP of the United States versus the GDP of California. Uh, I took this data, started at 2005, I normalized it, so we put an index of, of, of 100, let it rip. And you can see here, if you follow my cursor, you can see basically neck and neck, uh, California is keeping up with the U.S. and vice versa, but right around 2014, you notice there's an outperformance here. So between 2014 to uh, 2019, California actually added 21% to its GDP. Now, when you look at other states, the second fastest growing state was New York up 14%. And Texas, everybody thinks that Texas, or every Californian is gonna to move to Texas and it's great and it's growing, it, you know, might be one of those things, but California is still way out produced Texas. So Texas in that same period grew 12%, again, versus 21% for California. In fact, to, to look globally, uh, California over that period beat all countries, every country was beaten by California except for China. China had a, a faster growth rate. It's the only place in the world other than outside of California that grew that grew faster. So along comes COVID. We all see the drop off here. Quick, sharp recovery 
And if you look at the, the, the national GDP number, we've got a few more extra quarters because it's more current. We have to wait a couple quarters to get the remaining here for California. But the last recent GDP reading for September for third quarters is the first estimate uh, out of the national number was 2%. Uh, we all wanted to see it higher, but the 2% could be from supply constraints, you know, um, we all know about trying to get stuff, you can't get stuff, car manufacturers are in trouble finding chips. This whole supply chain issue is really slowing down delivery of these final goods, but the demand is there. So um, even the auto industry, the analysts say that if we could buy the cars we wanted today and the transportation uh, things for, for these, these items, you would actually put another 2% on top of the GDP we had uh, for last quarter. So that potential, 2% is, you know, out there in subsequent quarters, who you would think. So, but California, it's a, it's a powerhouse of productivity, essentially. So, all of those that overperformance to the rest of the country and, and other higher growing states, you can see that, I love this slide because it comes from an article titled from Bloomberg, California defies doom. Uh, with number one U.S. economy. I mean, it, 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 you know, so many articles written about the great demise of California, everybody's leaving, it's too expensive, and so on and so forth. But it is a very highly productive place. So uh, you can tell here that quarterly revenue per publicly traded company uh, has uh, is showing here a 50% greater from one million to one and a half of revenue generated per quarter per publicly traded employee. That, that is an incredible chart. Now to basically define how you get that, you sure got to have the population, right? So um, when I look back at the growth of California, I'd like to break it down in like two phases. So starting in the early 60s through right before the early 90s recession, right towards it, California had a growth rate twice that of the United States. Then from there, a shift down, this is the period I'm taking it, um, still outgrowing the United States, uh, still growing. The last several years, things have slowed for the United States, but more so for California. But that's not necessarily a bad thing we're gonna see later on, but we've got 39 and a half million people in California. That's, that's gonna be 40 million uh, not, in the not too distant future. So let's let's talk about that. Um, one of my favorite charts here is well the top line. The, the bottom line on this chart is not so good, but the top line is births. And what we're going to get at is this natural increase in, in, in California. But let's focus in on this this green line up here. Follow my my cursor. So you can see generations in this line. So on the far left, this is the peak of the baby boom generation in the early 60s followed by the baby bust, sorry for your, your, your X generation, but you're known as the baby bust, bottoming in the early 70s. And then from there, we had this run up, this is the millennial generation, I call them the echo boom generation, peaking in uh, the early 90s, so 89, 91, there's a peak up in here. They're also referred to as the Y generation. And uh, I, I was thinking the other day, or putting this together, is that if you're like me, uh, a peak baby boomer, and you may have a late 20-year-old or early 30-year-old uh, living at home, financially dependent, um, or both of those things, you have to ask yourself, well, well why am I still doing this? And uh, perhaps they will be saying, well, why not? Uh, the bank of dad and mom's cooking is still pretty good. So uh, eventually, eventually, though, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that with these, these kids who will eventually get going. But you had a little bit of a baby bust after the early 90s, and then off starts this new generation. And this another generation is called the Z generation. And it comes from the, the, the birth of that comes from the early baby, uh, excuse me, echo boomers in here. And so as we peaked in 2005, 6, 7 of this generation, we're now starting back to the beginning of the alphabet, the A generation. So, but you're looking at this downturn here and, you know, if you, you don't want to draw a straight line, this is going to drop and drop and drop. Look back at where you've got potential to have more bursts in the state of California. And it's going to come from these st still living at home, late 20 year olds, early 30 year olds, 
they've got great potential at some point they're going to get out on their own they're going to find that first someone for the first time and uh, start having a family and you're, they're going to start adding to already these this birth rate here so i would imagine that this is a temporary condition in the years ahead we're going to see this turning up but one line on here we really can't change the path on unless they move out of california and, and that is this red line so these are uh, departures no forwarding address and um you we know that this baby boom generation which is quite large um uh, pretty hard to, uh, you know, keep extending the clock. So this line is likely to, to not decrease anytime soon. So today, the difference between births and deaths you have in California, the lowest natural increase about 45 years that you hit this lowest point uh, in California. But again, we've got hope coming from, you know, these, these more births coming. So let's, let's plan on that. We all want to be your grandparents at, uh, at uh, you know, at our later middle age. So on to this next slide. Um, again, one of my favorites, and it shows California's had a spectacular uh, immigration from people born in other countries. And, and going back to the early 60s, we've never had a negative year. So the inflows have always been positive. Whereas if we look for people that are moving interstate from other states into California and netting that for people leaving, uh, all the way up until the early 90s recession, essentially they, they were matching the incoming from, from foreign born, but then things went the other way. So um, from the early 90s recession, a big drop ran back up and we got positive right at the uh, tail end of the uh, internet boom, uh, right before that busted in 2000 and beyond. And then um, we then, have really struggled with having a net increase from interstate people moving in, net moving out ever since. And now again, that this isn't necessarily a screaming bad problem because you have to find out, well, who is coming in and who is leaving. And that brings us to this slide. What I did here is I look at through, this is a histogram, look at the yellow lines first. So the these, these vertical lines, this is a, uh, a baby boom, or excuse me, it's baby boom is in there, but this is the age distribution um, of these cohorts in California virtually today. And then what I wanted to do is find out you know, who's coming, who's gone. So I just went back to 2005, I had the same distribution that I then pushed forward or leg forward 15 years so we could see who's coming and who's, who's left. And essentially what you can see here by the slide that a little less than two, 2 million baby boomers left, but you had incoming. And here's what's real important. You had basically later Xers, the uh, the, the, Z, the millennial generation is right in here, uh, the early part of them. And then here's your Z generation, and now you've got your A's coming, okay? So here's your kids right here. But what I really want you to, to look here is like who is really leaving? So the boomers are leaving. Okay, is that is that such a bad problem? Not really, because you think about it. If if you, you're somebody in your late 50s, early 60s, or 70s, you you've owned your home in California for you know many many years. You have a low cost basis. You have a low tax basis. So as you sell that home, and this young these younger generations are purchasing the home, you now you're stepping up, you know the tax basis. You know, typically in a, in a sale of a home, there's all kinds of things that go into it. You know, they're, they're, they're leveraging money, they're borrowing to you know, do more things. Very stimulative in for these younger generations that the older generation has then moved on from. So, uh, and also too, when I look at this particular distribution, if you looked at this compared to nationwide, there's, there's usually a big drop off between boomers and the younger generation, but California, because we've had really the, the, the baby boomers are moving out and the younger people are moving in, you're getting a smoothing effect that, that really helps California, you know, again, mitigate any kind of demographic cliff that other countries have and other states have in the United States. So I, I just find that fascinating. Now, again, we're going to go back to 
you know, the older generation and look at what they're they're doing and hopefully they're finally retiring, we'll see. But this slide comes from, uh, covers the massive increase in participation of seniors in the workforce from 2000. Uh, so, you know, you're right up here at 75 and older and here's your cohorts going down. But since COVID came in, there's been uh, a lot of people leaving the workforce of this age group. So it'll be interesting to see if they return. You don't know, but assumably they'll, some of these groups will eventually retire, maybe for health reasons they don't want to come back. Maybe they discovered that you know, they really like doing other things than working. Whatever the case, uh, you now have to rely on the younger cohorts to pick up those jobs that will be open. So, but who could that be? And, and by the way, what do you want in your, in your economy the most of that are, are people making the most amount of money? And that's going to be, and this slide's going to tell you, and you probably don't need to be told this, but if you're in your mid 40s to mid 50s, you're making the most amount of money in your lifetime. So you're, you know, the peak of your career, the, the, the peak of your abilities, uh, the peak of your pay. Um, but right behind that age group is the 35 to 44 year old. You can see these two right here, they're really close to one another. So really you can say between 35 and 55 in that length of that, that those two big groups uh, are the big income, income producers and drivers. And they're also uh, peak spenders, by the way. I don't have a slide here, but you do reach the peak in your spending. Um, in, in your mid to early 50s, depending on mid 40s to, to mid early 50s, depending on your um, how long you spent in school and so forth. But another interesting part of this chart is go down at the bottom and you can see the 65 year olds. So 65 year olds make the same amount of money as a teenager to early 20 year old. So again, to power home the point, it's okay for the seniors to, to move along, free up those jobs, free up that income for the younger generation as they move up that uh, income ladder. So let's let's segue into uh, everybody's favorite subject in California, and Treasurer Ma was pointing this out about how expensive California is, um, but it's, it's been expensive too in the past. And uh, you can tell here, we went, I went back to 1990, uh, index the national uh, median home price uh, with California and uh, comparing this huge run up in, in 2000, 2005, 2007, uh, you know, and everybody had to have, uh, you know, one or two or three homes and we know how that ended, um, you know, nationwide that, that also occurred to be a big bubble. And here in California, right about 2012, um, ever since then, it's really been up. So after that bottoming process, uh, California has really worked its way back up, of course, with the national number two. Now, so today, uh, the median home price in California is just a little over $800,000. Um, but of course, depending on where you live or want to live in California, that can vary uh, greatly. So if you get that great job in San Jose, you, 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 you better be paid a lot because the median home price, you know, there in Silicon Valley is $1.7 million. Uh, a little bit cheaper if you want to go up to San Francisco, you're, you'll be $1.4 million. Uh, the LA area is $775,000, a little bit below median. Uh, it's a big county. Um, Sacramento, Sacramento, it's a deal. It's a steal. $500,000 for your median price a home in Sacramento. Now, um, to kind of look at the comparison between prices and rent, uh, this is the red line, which is the uh, owner's equivalent of rent. And it's, it's a survey done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics to, to figure out what, what owners would, would charge for their rent. And I don't think it's a very good, a very good uh, number to, to say what rent is. I think either we should rely more on the, the Zillows of the world or Realtor.com that gives us hardcore data, that gives us you know, the actual rental prices, but it is what it is. It's a very important number to CPI because this, this part of the index is about 30%. So if you had a big increase in what owners thought they could rent their home for, you, you, that would be really reflected in CPI and vice versa. But another part of the slide is before advance is that you can see there's periods of time where we get way overdone compared to what rent is. 
I don't know if we're here today. I mean, this whole COVID effect of nesting and super cheap money has driven uh, these prices uh, very high. So one would hope that we would have rentals catch up, uh, but maybe there's an adjustment period uh, there somewhere. But from a, um, um, excuse me, from a standpoint of, of, a, of ability to borrow and debt service, this slide tells us that at least back in the last bubble we had in real estate, we were way over leveraged to what we were producing. Today, it's much more in line. And if I had the slide here, I'd show you that um, if you took the disposable income today versus your debt service level, that number is the lowest in 30 years. So because rates are so low, um, you can have a lot of debt, but your servicing of that debt is, is very low. We're not sure how long that's going to continue, though, right? Um, but the Federal Reserve has had a lot to do with where we are um, as a chief manipulator, if I can say that, uh, of, of uh, you know, our, our money system. So here we're looking at the Fed's balance sheet, um, going through its various quantitative easing and tightening programs. So financial crisis, when money was flooded into the system, Moving along, it feels like forever this balance sheet has been building, and today we're up to about eight and a half trillion dollars. Um, and uh, in fact, I think Jay Powell is actually speaking right about now, and uh, what he may be telling us is that they're beginning to taper, so that by this month through May, uh, they will not be adding to the balance sheet, or adding less, I should say. So uh, they're adding 120 billion per month, and they want to get that. I believe that's what he's going to tell us. Uh, to zero by May of next year. So, but that would still, by the time you got to May, if that's what's going to happen, you're still going to be close to this nine trillion dollars. And uh, yeah, that that, that that's, that's not reducing the balance sheet. That's just you, you've stopped at. Um, so a lot of money. I mean, just buckets of money have been added to the system. Money supply has grown 35 percent over the last uh, year and a half. That's just a staggering amount of money. You, you basically, you've had, well, basically, this is the number, uh, since 2000, money supply has grown 345%. Uh, that's 7% a year, which actually equates to the S&P 500. So lots of money have gone into stock prices and real estate prices. Um, but how quickly is that money moving through the system? So this slide looks at the velocity of money, which takes GDP divided by money supply, and it's been cut in half over the last 20 years, 20 plus years. And um, you know, a lot of that's the math of the equation, right? So if you have a higher money supply going up, you know, you're going to, in the GDP, you're going to reduce this number. Um, but, and some people think this is really negative. I look at this more positive because, my goodness, can you imagine if you got the economy moving this money faster to where we were at previous periods, you can imagine the kind of growth you get out of that. So what the potential for GDP growth. So, um, Coming back to all this money coming in and out, I love to look at these long-term cycle patterns. And um, what I did here is I look back into from 50s to the early 80s, we can see we had a higher, the, 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 the white line on here is CPI. As uh, inflation grew, interest rates rose, this is the 10-year treasury, and peaking right in, in the early 80s, and from that period to now, almost to now, before now, we've had this disinflation period. So 40 years of, of essentially inflation coming down, interest rates coming down, up until this circle right here. This is the CPI from September of this year to September of last year. Um, and we're gonna have the October's number coming out next week. Um, and it's, and according to Bloomberg's, looking for 5.8% uh, year on year number. Um, that's up from 5.4. So we'll, we'll see if that census works out. We'll know, like I said, next week. But I don't know. When I was looking at the slide and putting it together for this update, I thought, geez, that's like a James Bond movie here. You know, it starts off like you can't believe and, and you're riveted uh, to the screen. Everywhere. So we'll, we'll, let, let's hope that's not all about inflation if this thing is taken off like crazy. But um, that is a real eye opener. So. Another kind of way to express that is what the five-year treasury's done over these decades. 
Um, and again, this disinflation period where uh, the five-year treasuries have gone to lower lows, lower highs, all the way down until about 2018, we started to peak out of this, this whole downward channel. Uh, didn't live there very long, broke down in 2019, here comes COVID, wham. We didn't get to zero, but we got close on the five-year. And then uh, it took, you know, here up until just recently, this is really the last four or five weeks, we've had a very explosive rally uh, in interest rates. Um, right this second, actually, we're sitting at 121, which is precisely what this chart says. And um, this, this white line on the top, if you can follow with me, that channel today is a 160. And since this is a downward mm -hmm. slope, if you get out to uh, six, six months from now uh, to May, that's a 150. So this isn't too far away from potentially where you can go. And uh, we have to really keep an eye on this. So maybe the years ahead, who knows, maybe this downward channel becomes something upward. Um, yeah, you can't put together a presentation without looking here, talking about inflation, if you don't look at commodity prices. So the price of stuff. And um, when you look at the price of stuff, the CRB index, relative again to the five-year treasury, you can see they, they should really, really rhyme, right? So they should be correlated. And, and as we've gone through this peak 2018, we had 3% on the five-year treasury. We did also on the two and the 10. We were all way up there. But now when COVID hit particularly, as everything collapsed, uh, but then, of course, the supply situations, because we still needed to eat and, and, and have things, right? Um, here comes the CRB index. It, it absolutely exploded. You know, agricultural products, um, uh, foodstuffs, metals, um, uh, energy prices, you know, lumber, even though lumber is up, was up 300%, it's now only up 60%, but it still kept going. So the, the key takeaway in the slide is that you have a massive disparity between where interest rates are today to where commodity prices uh, are. Um, this chart, I love this chart. Oops, kind of went too far. Let's go back to the chart I love. Okay, so this chart, he's kind of trying to pull it all together, including the Fed. And let's keep your eye on this green line. This is important. This is your CPI, again, year over year. Went back to 2016. And you can see here as it's, as it's, as it's moving along, so are interest rates, right? And then the Fed, since the Fed is, is not, you know, it's not, it says Fed's being reactionary. And, and, and so as it's forced to move its rates up along following the market in general, when you saw up here back in 2018, when the last time interest rates peaked, you could see prior to that, you started to see CPI drop off. Well, the Fed keeps moving along and peaks out in here in, in uh, the first, uh, a little more than the first half of 2019 and starts to lower rates. And then here you go, fast forward to COVID and slam, everything's down on the map. So when there are since COVID is um, really the early part of COVID, that's when boom, all of a sudden see CPI, look at this number. I mean, I've, I've had this chart for a while, but I have to keep changing, even, you know, the scale to fit this in. Um, so, you know, but you, you see here as CPI has advanced to this extraordinary level, um, you know, finally, we're getting some reaction uh, to these interest rate environments. So here's your five, your 10 year and your five year. And look at the Fed. It looks like they're asleep. Um, at, at some point, they, they, we will have to awaken this Fed funds uh, number. So let's see. Let's see maybe when that can be. Um, I've had people ask me, OK, Doug, you talk a lot about the five year. What about the two year? Tell me about the two year Treasury. So I wanted to see, OK. The last time the Fed began a, a, a meaningful series of rate hikes, when was that? So we look back in 2014 to 15, and um, the two-year Treasury more or less ranged in that 50 to 70 basis points, which is right about here. Now, when I did the slide, we were 52, right this moment, we're at 48 basis points, we're right in here. And um, so I would suspect that's your range, 50 to 70 basis points. You can see the Fed raised rates in December of 2015, and then didn't do much for 2016. Yet the, the two-year treasury had you know, spiked up to one, but then ended up trading you know, right in that 70 basis points, a little higher, came back down here to 50. So I think that's a reasonable range if you're you know, looking to base some you know, 
make some purchase of the two-year part of the curve, but you wanted to look to see maybe you get a better rate, you're, you know, I, I'd be looking more at the 60 to 65 to maybe add to the position here. But you don't know. I mean, the Fed, if the Fed's going to start to really uh, maybe catch up to this uh, earlier than we think, then, um, yeah, we'll have to see if we're going to be in multiple stair rises. Well, st stair steps, we, again, we, we, we won't know until we're there. On my last slide, so thanks for hanging with me during this period. I hope I'm, I didn't check my time, but um, this last slide's important to me at least. I wanted to see as, as COVID came in and as a five-year treasury collapsed, where at what levels could it retrace or recover to? And so I, I had to wait till we found a bottom. So we go from you know March of 2020 and we ended up bottoming and we didn't know when it's gonna bottom, uh, but in the summer of 20. And then right about uh, last winter, um, I started to say, okay, we, we may have a bottom here. And let's see what kind of retracement numbers we can get to on recovery. So uh, you can do this on Bloomberg. Anybody can. It's a Fibonacci chart of retracement. And so you just start your, tar your starting point, your low point, and it produces these numbers. So um, what I came up with is that I just thought your first retracement would be in this area in here, 68.83. Interesting enough, we hit it. And we basically hung around the stock. We tried to break out a few times. And now fast forward all the way through... Um, uh, going into the summer, we did come back and retest it, broke back up again, and now we're going, you know, coming in uh, into the first part of September, and then bam, towards the end of September, this explosive ride up, rise up, and now we're into the second retracement. Well, we haven't really stopped, so we we've broken up here again. We're sitting at almost exactly where I've got that number. We're sitting at 120 and change, and. Um, I would suspect you're, I mean, if I'm going to take a guess at this, where you're going from here, is you could consolidate just like you have after really big moves. But if these inflation numbers keep coming at us so fast and so hard, you're not seeing any ebbing of the inflation rate that um, Powell's probably speaking about as, as we're here. Um, but, you know, if, if we're a year from now, and inflation is still running at three and a half, four percent 4%, I, I can't imagine year rates are anywhere this low. Um, the next number I want to look at after we complete this whole retracement of 100% uh, is about the 150 area. So the five-year treasury spent a lot of time going back to 2013, 14, 15, some parts of 2016, right at that 150, 160 area. So I want to call that neutral. I just made that up. It's, it's a neutral neutral number. It's, you know, it's between almost zero and going back to 3% like we saw in 2018. But I, I think that's a good number uh, to, uh, you know, to, to have a goal for. And then again, if we're going to have to start seeing more of this driver of, um, you know, between uh, labor and the tightness of labor and particularly the inflation rate and, of course, how the Fed's going to react to all that. So um, I think I made it through in 30 minutes. I'm not so sure. But uh, but I think it's a good place for me to, to end and turn it over to uh, turn it over to the LAFE team. Looking forward to hear what they have to say. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Doug. Um, and as Christina says earlier, if you have any questions for Doug, please save them. He'll be around to the end of our presentation, and that's when you can ask him and us any questions you may have. Um, so now we're going to be moving to the investment team. Join us and provide you with information on the LAFE program. Good morning. I am Kristen Sikalian Moore. I'm your director of investments, and I will be working with Jeff Worm, our assistant director, and Tracy Payne, our credit manager, to provide you with information on the investment management of your LAFE money. And then Christina Saran, our LAFE administrator, will give an overview of LAFE operations and administration. Next slide. So my part of the presentation today is to provide you with what I call a 30,000 foot um, view of our investment program. Jeff and Tracy are going to dive down into this system. I'll cover what are the factors that guide our overall investment management, what drives our selection of certain investments over others, and what economic information we pay attention to, how the investment landscape continues to change, and how this has impacted our numbers related to the portfolio. 
portfolio, and then finally, why regardless of all these changes, you can still be assured that your money is being managed for business. Next slide. As most of you are already aware, uh, LAPE operates like a short-term liquid investment pool. We're not a registered money market fund. However, we share a lot of similarities in our operations. Your late deposits are combined with our state government funds, which are then invested in a slate of high-quality investments. Late, as you may already know, is part of the pooled money investment account, the purpose of which is to operate as a high cash account. We manage investments of these funds as a short-term investment pool, keeping our overall weighted average maturity under a year while making sure the investments are liquid to meet daily withdrawals by late participants as well as by state agencies. As part of our investment plan, we emphasize government securities, and by this I mean we largely um, invest in federal treasury bills and notes, which obviously are the gold standard for safety and liquidity. While government code allows us a longer maturity, we generally keep our note purchases to three years or less, at least at this point in time. And we focus largely on bullet security. We also rely on government sponsored agencies such as Federal Home Loan Bank and Federal Farm Credit Bank, and also supranational such as the World Bank, IFC, and IABB. These options provide us with investments that are highly rated, but that also have maturity dates that are more flexible than, say, Treasury bills, which we mature on Tuesday and Thursday, and which is very important to meeting our cash flow needs. Other capital market securities that are purchased, such as commercial paper, CDs, and corporate bonds, are all highly rated, you know, top three rankings by credit agencies. And Tracy will talk a little bit more about that, um, about how she goes about evaluating the banks and corporations that issue those securities. But let me say that we do go through a very detailed and thoughtful evaluation of these investments because we need to maintain the safety and liquidity of the pool to ensure that the money will be there when to meet your withdrawal demands as well as that of the state agency. We work very closely with the forecasting groups of our state treasurer's office to manage the net cash position, and we try to find the best value in the investments that we purchase to provide a competitive return on your funds, but ensuring safety and liquidity liquidity are foremost in our investment management process. Next slide. In addition to the government and non-government securities that we purchase, the Treasurer's Office operates a time deposit program out of the pool money investment account, which provides indirect support to local communities in California. The state operates this voluntary program for California headquartered community banks, credit unions, savings and loans to receive positive state funds at the desirable rates for their use to provide liquidity for community investments such as small business loans. This program provides investment returns to LAFE and the PMIA while also helping California communities prosper. And while this is a voluntary program, our staff does do a very extensive credit analysis of the financial institution before lending the money to them, and also while they maintain activity in the program. The program currently stands at approximately $4 billion, and this is invested in over 50 community financial institutions. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn to what types of information assist us in determining what investments to purchase. Um, many of us start the morning by reading the overnight economic summaries that we get from various economists and services that we subscribe to, seeing how the market is moving, observing what economic indicators have been reported, such as inflation rates, job reports, GDP. We also review treasury rates on our Bloomberg terminals, look at where the yield curve is and how it has changed overnight, and where prices are at in specific maturity ranges that we typically may be interested in. Yield curve spreads may be something we look at to see the trend over time because it's the bellwether for predicting recessions, and when these spreads go negative, meaning that yield curve has inverted, uh, a recession typically follows within the next six to 12 months. Knowing this is particularly helpful to gauge the strength of the economy. And incorporating this information into our daily decision-making process has been helpful from our perspective to determine where we want the average life of the pool to be and what types of investments we purchase as a result. Next slide. So the actions of the Fed, statements by its members, and in particular pronouncements by Chair Jerome
Jerome Powell also provide information um, to guide their decisions. The Fed obviously, as Doug alluded to, has played a significant role in trying to curb the downturn in the economy and encourage economic growth. And like you, we are waiting on information today on the specifics of the Fed tapering of bond purchases and potential hints that may leak out as to the timing of rate increases. And by the end of this webinar, we should have a little bit of clarity on that information. Uh, the Fed's potential actions, along with our continued concern in the past year and a half over the market's ability to meet liquidity demands, at, particularly at the short end of the Treasury curve, which is where we do most of our purchasing, has kept us focusing on keeping our portfolio very liquid. And Jeff will share more details on this with you shortly. Next slide. So this slide, for those of you who may have been here uh, attending the light webinar last year, the background is very similar. And I kept it that way purposely because, once again, that the landscape is ever-changing. Um, the events of the past 18 months continue to affect our investment decisions um, significantly. The changes from August 2020 to August 2021 show this. So I've just chosen that data to um, give you that comparison. The PMIA has increased over $60 billion during this time frame due to federal stimulus funds received and increases to income tax receipts from both individuals and businesses in the state. Late, likewise, has increased as local governments like yourself have deposited stimulus payments into it, um, and also because late tails to trend is, tails to, uh, tends to trail its competitors. So when rates decline, it becomes a more attractive investment opportunity. The PMIA average monthly yield bears the results of the changing rate environment, going from almost three quarters of a percent down to about seven percent. And I've also included two key rates that provide some context to the decline in the full yield um, that we see, which is the effective federal funds rate and the one-year Trevor Treasury Trump Security. Um, it's definitely been a challenging, um, it's been challenging managing such a large investment pool in this environment. But we feel we've successfully maneuvered incredible growth in the size without compromising safety and liquidity, and have also sustained a respectful yield in the current extremely low interest rate environment. Next slide. Well, uh, the uncertainty over the economy and the timing of interest rates, you know, remain the core principles we want to make sure you're aware uh, behind the management of our money remains the same. State government code, first of all, provides specific restrictions to the types of investments, the credit quality, the material length, and also the amount available for us to invest. And beyond this, our investment policy affirms these requirements and provides further restrictions. And for example, you know, we are not required by law uh, to have a certain period for our treasuries that we buy, but we restrict it to five years in our investment policy. And in our current practice, it's even shorter. We take, uh, we've taken a conservative investment approach to maintain a safe, liquid um, cash flow portfolio, and we do this through diversification of investments, minimizing credit risk exposure by requiring only the highest rated um, investments from you know, credit rating agencies. We spread our maturities over the short run to minimize interest rate risk in a volatile market environment, and we select investments and maturities to meet forecast cash needs to ensure sufficient liquidity to meet your withdrawals, as I've said, and also that of the The staff managing your investments has broad and deep experience in investment and treasury management. We currently have nine authorized investment traders, and I did the math with collectively 188 years of experience, and that's primarily in the state, which averages about 21 years per person. So we all look very young, may I imagine. We started when we were just babies. Um, in addition to portfolio management, we have staff that have experience in cash forecasting, security clearance, and bond finance. Um, this has been particularly important and essential during the time period when most staff have been teleworking and we've had to use an online um, meeting platform to communicate our trading activity. So I just want to finish my part of the program by saying in, that the money you deposit with us is guaranteed to you, regardless of your earnings. We operate an investment pool, uh, you know, a liquid cash management pool, but as a late participant, your principal will be returned to you when you need to withdraw it. And this is why we focus so much on the quality and the liquidity of our investment. And, also, and it's also why you should be rest assured that your money is safe. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Jeff to provide you with some more details on our investment strategies and portfolio management. Next slide. Hello, 
everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, it's an honor to be able to talk directly to you, and I'll echo what the treasurer said earlier. We look forward to being able to meet with you in person at an actual conference again very soon. I tend to have more fun having you guys right in front of me when I do my presentation, but um, I, I always start my part with uh, the first page of our monthly report. You can get an over overview of what the PMI looked like at June 30, our fiscal year end of this year. Um, echoing what uh, Kristen just mentioned, you see right at the top, 70% of the portfolio was in treasuries. Um, you combine a couple of the agency lines right below that, 13% uh, age agency, so 83% of our portfolios in treasuries and agencies, uh, right in line with our, uh, the PMIA investment policy. Uh, first goal is to uh, be safe. <laughs> Safety is number one, uh, liquidity is second, and lastly, we worry about yield. Um, and I'm glad Kristen brought up the time deposit program. It's a very uh, important part of what the treasurer's office represents, you know, trying to give back to communities. This program really is meant for the smaller uh, community banks and credit unions and who work with smaller groups and, and gives them much more liquidity and ability to be flexible to help their communities grow. Uh, other than that, uh, if the, the size of the portfolio, as you can see, is rather large. If you look at the bottom line, as of June 30, our portfolio was at $193 billion. A lot of that was money that came in in June. I'll, I'll discuss that again in a, in a little bit, but um, it looks as though the corporate side of our portfolio has kind of shrunk by percentage, but if you look at the total dollars, it hasn't. Um, Tracy will get to talk about that in a little bit here. So let's go to the next page, please. Uh, this is just a kind of a snapshot view of where we were 10 years ago and where we are today and kind of what the 10-year average was in between. Uh, treasuries have been a big part of this. Uh, this goes back to the original financial crisis, kind of got us leaning towards uh, much more safety-driven. Uh, and now June 30 this year, treasuries are both safety and kind of out of necessity because of how large the portfolio has grown. Uh, the other part that kind of looks a little different again is if you look at the CDs and bank notes, um, the 10-year average is around 17% of the portfolio, but as of June 30, it's 8%, and that's just at the pure size of how large the portfolio has gotten, not by choice of ours to alter the way we do business. Let's look at the next slide, please. Um, these are all familiar. I know you guys have seen this presentation before, uh, sticking with the same bar chart we always do here uh, over the last 10 years. And not a whole lot has changed. Uh, again, if you look at the last line, so this most recent fiscal year end, treasuries are much larger than they've ever been. The second largest time frame was June 30, uh, it was 2013. Uh, it was just over 60% was in treasuries. Um, and if you see the agencies kind of shrunk at that time, it was a lot harder to find them, which is kind of what's going on now. Those of you who do the same types of investing that we do on a daily basis, it's a lot harder to find agencies to work with uh, in terms of the discount of world, especially Fannie and Freddie. They've been uh, persona non grata, I like to say, almost every day. We, we never see the names anymore. And I know you guys are fighting and struggling for the same types of investments and seeing that. What I realized recently is on this chart, what I should have done at the top is let you guys know how large the PMI was through each one of these bars. Because saying a percentage is kind of one thing, but if you add the actual total dollars, it's completely different. So I will, and I'll fill you guys in here. So June 30, 2012, the PMIA was around $60 billion. We'll skip two years to 2014, it grew to $64 billion, so only $4 billion over two years. Now here's where things start to change. You go to June 30, 2016, $77 billion at fiscal year end. June 30, 2018, $89 billion at fiscal year end. And just last year, June 30 of 2020, it was $103 billion. First time we had broke $100 billion at fiscal year end. But then if you go to June 30 of 21, it was $193 billion. So the, the speed at which the PMI is growing is crazy. And you can kind of correlate that with LAFE. LAFE has also grown, most of my career here averaged between 20 to $22 billion. Just kind of hovered there, hovered there, hovered there. Now we're at $35 billion. Same type of large increase. It's, uh, it's kind of across the board. I think a lot of you are facing the same thing. Your portfolio has grown also. Go to the next slide. Um, Using treasuries as a cash management tool, um, really important to us. Uh, many of you know that there's a treasury market every single day of the year, almost 24-7, because foreign governments are constantly buying, or foreign markets are buying treasuries all the time. Um, what was nice with this expansion from the Fed to issue more treasuries was they issued a four-month bill, which kind of filled in even more dates for us. So uh, instead of just only being able to buy treasuries on Thursdays and or the last business day of the month, and we can now add Tuesdays, so as you can see, it's gotten a lot more clustered in the four-month arena in terms of how many treasuries we were carrying at fiscal year end. Um, 
it is a conscious effort on our part, one, because of the safety, and two, they're a very liquid security, and it kind of gives us the confidence to know that we can handle any large changes in cash flow direction. Um, right now, I'm going to kind of pause my presentation, and I'm going to be able to introduce Tracy so she can talk to you about the more fun part of the portfolio in the corporate world. Okay, on the next, on the next slide. So beyond our treasury and federal agency positions, most of the remaining investments are in certificates of deposit and commercial paper, and um, recently we've added a few corporate bonds. Um, on June 30, these holdings totaled um, $27 billion, which is about an average amount for the security type. Next slide. And that $27 billion consisted of 28 different commercial paper programs and 33 different financial institutions CD programs. And each one of those programs is represented by a different color on these pie charts, showing that we maintain a diverse mix of programs in order to ensure we are minimizing our risk, risk and credit exposure to any single firm or institution. Some of the larger holdings were with our domestic banks, which are represented with our logos across the top, Citibank, JP Morgan, Bank of the West, and Union Bank. In total, we do have about 100 issuers that are approved for investment in commercial paper, certificates of deposit, and corporate bonds. And we do monitor the credit strength of each on an ongoing basis to ensure that the CMI is protected and that we are meeting our number one goal, which is safety. So how do we do that? Next slide. How do we monitor the approved investment? We collect data and information from the primary rating agencies, SEC, Moody's, and Fitch, as well as other reliable news sources, and this information can include credit rating, credit analysis, such as the reasoning behind any credit rating changes, their financials, performance reports, industry outlook, and any other news that could have an impact on the issuer and would be critical for us to consider as part of our evaluation. Next slide. Then we use the collected information to, at minimum, ensure the investments are in compliance with government code and the investment policy. And from there, we analyze how the ratings and financials are changing in order to ensure the stability and financial strength of the issuers. And then we evaluate their performance and any news events and determine what kind of impact those might have for us and how we are going to proceed with that information. At least weekly, the critical information we've collected is consolidated and documented and discussed amongst the team. And then whether the information is positive or negative, we determine if, if that will generate a change in our investment strategy. Sometimes a change in strategy can be subtle, such as how much we are investing or the length of time of an investment. And other times it can be more straightforward, such as if we stop investing in them completely and for how long. So will it be a until a deficiency is resolved or could it be forever? So any changes in our strategy can be a dynamic process and often dependent on the information that is available at the time. Next slide. In order to continue to enhance the PMIA's safety, liquidity, and yield, we continually look for new programs to add as approved investments. When looking for new programs, they must um, be in compliance with government code and investment policy, including the rating criteria um, to ensure that they're 
prime quality and rated by at least two nationally recognized rating organizations. Then, like the information we collect to monitor our existing approved investments, we collect information on prospective programs and complete a comprehensive credit analysis to help determine if the program should be added as an approved investment. So that would include evaluating their financials, their performance, and their ratings, and looking at how all of those have changed over time and how they compare to peers. And we also look for any news or current events and evaluate what impact those have. We look for larger programs, uh, commercial papers specifically, the portfolio holdings, cannot exceed 10% of the program's outstanding. So the program size has to be significant to accommodate the large size transactions that we do. And that concludes my part. Those are the highlights of the processes we use to ensure safe investment. We will turn it back over. Sorry, I'm gonna slide back over. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Um, all right, so go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's where we get to have a little bit of a retrospective view, kind of timely with the Fed meeting today. Um, prior to this time, I had no idea what a dot plot was, and going back to 2016 here. A simpler times as I put on my little notes here, when rates were on the way up, the Fed had finally raised rates at December of 2015, and all right, here we go, things are gonna take off, right? So this is what the, the dot plot looked like then. Uh, rates uh, had, like I said, they had raised at one time, uh, the Fed met, and the majority of them felt on average that by 2017, um, after this meeting in June of 2016, that rates should be around one and a half, and even 2018, looking out further, about two and a half percent. Let's go to the next slide. And we'll kind of look at how they did, and they were pretty darn close. They did a really good job. They, they had a good plan, and they stuck to the plan, and um, this is kind of how it went. So we have the, the PMIA is the blue line. Um, the only thing that we can remotely compare the PMA to is the S&P gift index. They're not exactly, it's kind of like apples and pears, not apples and oranges. It's, uh, they're a much shorter life portfolio, but invest in the same, same types of securities. And you got the Fed funds right, right there, and so we can show you how we're doing. So we'll go to the next slide. So we'll go to that, that June of 2018, the Fed meets again, and, uh, you know, it, rates are around 2%, almost 2.5, and, and the, they're looking forward, and they, they feel... Uh, possibly by 2019, 3%, even 3.5% by 2020, um, longer term back down to 3%. Let's flip the page, go to the next slide, please. And we know what happened, what they predicted didn't uh, as <laughs> rates tumbled. And again, this shows you that the smartest people who have all the information currently can't tell you what's going to happen next. And we, it's kind of the one thing that I, I've been saying for the last few years is we, can look back and have a plan for everything we've seen. We don't have a plan for what we haven't seen, but we're going to stay stay the course. It seems to be working, and uh, we're, we're kind of sticking through this. The other thing this chart shows is uh, something that Kristen mentioned earlier is that because of our average life, we tend to trail what the market does as rates go up. We're a little bit behind as they go down. We're a little bit behind at this time with our average life in these days, averaging about 180 days is only about six months behind. Next slide, please. So June of 2020, the Fed met, and holy cow, they had absolutely no optimism whatsoever that rates were going to go anywhere anytime soon. Every single one of them was in agreement that we're not changing rates anytime soon. Two, two people said maybe in two years. <laughs> All right, so we're going to flip the page one more time. June of this year, they met again, and now we have a little bit of kind of, okay, things are looking better. We're starting to get a, a better idea of what's going on in the world and they're starting to get a little bit of, of, as my note says, some of the hawks are starting to chirp a little bit, and they have a little bit of optimism that rates can start creeping back up. So here's my opportunity. I think I did this last year with you guys. I have now nominated you all. You're all going to be a dot on the Fed plot <laughs> chart, and we're going to do a poll question here and see where you guys think rates are going to be next year. And hopefully none of you have been watching the Fed meet today. I don't know if they're talking about it, and you guys are cheating and getting a head start on us. But um, do we think rates are going to be no change, which is still kind of where uh, the Fed was talking earlier this year? Um, do we think they will raise at one time anywhere from 25 to 50 basis points? Or will they be super aggressive and go for one large increase at a time and do it less frequently like they did last time, maybe 50 basis points, 1%? Or do you think they're going to be over 1% by next year at this time? 
just kind of wanted to have a little fun with you guys and give you guys a chance to play Fed voting dot person just for a few minutes here and uh, kind of give us an idea of where you're thinking. And then I'll, I'll tell you where, where I've been thinking. I can't speak for everybody here. We all have different thoughts, which is why we're a great team. We all have to come at this from different directions and have different opinions on what we're reading. Um, hopefully, did I reach 30 seconds? I'll give everybody enough time to vote. We can move on. We'll go to the next slide, please. Just a historical view, kind of a long, long term kind of showing back up and down with the curve of the PMIA trails. Um, nothing super exciting, just wanted to show it again in uh, kind of an overall view. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, on average, the historical uh, average life of the PMIA has been about 180, 200 days, almost like clockwork forever and ever and ever. Uh, now the portfolio has grown, uh, as I said, June 30 of this year up to 190 billion. Uh, the average life has crept over 300 days. Yes, we know. Um, yes, you have a reason to ask if you'd like to call, but I'm going to answer the question now. <laughs> um, I think it's more of a product of the environment. I'm going to show you here on one of my last slides why I don't think it's as much of a concern as it sounds like. We'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, kind of two, three different uh, investment environments with the yield treasury curve. Kind of show you the, the one at the very top was 2018, uh, June of 2018. The next one down was June of 2012. Uh, the bottom one was June of 2020, kind of shows you that it, it's kind of a different environment. Just a reminder, as Kristen said earlier, we tend to stay in the three years and in, um, so that's the farthest left part of these charts. Let's go to the next slide, please. Kind of show you how the Fed funds rate has moved around historically. It's done this before. We get higher rates and it comes down and uh, very reactionary and very uh, using their tools to help keep the economy rolling along and keeping everything working as it's supposed to be done. Okay, next slide. Fed met in September. Uh, so uh, let's see how let's see how everybody voted, and then we'll talk about what the Fed talked about in September. If we have the results, here we go. Okay. Um, of course, I have something in the way that I can't really see. Let me move that. Okay. So 16% of us feel that there will be no change. 61% in the 25 to 50 basis point range, and uh, a few more in the. Hopefully, the, the hopefuls, I like the, I like the 4%, I think we'll be over 1%. I'm with you. I would hope so, but that's, that's hoping. That's not what I really believe is going to happen. Um, <laughs> I, I think we're going to get one rate hike, but I still am not sure if it's just going to be a quarter of a basis point or a quarter, or will they do 50 and kind of see how it goes. Uh, again, it will be, if inflation keeps going, will be a, a big determining factor as they, they do the quantitative easing. But I really believe rates are going to have to be raised just to fight inflation. I don't think it's as transitory as um, we keep hearing. I don't like that term so much anymore because transitory has been said for how many meetings now? <laughs> and it hasn't been transitory as it keeps going up. Okay, so that was fun. Thank you for participating in that. We'll go on to the next slide. So the Fed met in September of 21, and uh, they probably have the same thought that you did uh, they actually kind of lean more towards like half feel like they could raise rates next year. The other half are kind of sticking right at zero to 25 basis points, but that was a month ago or two months ago, and a lot has changed since then. Uh, they were still leaning towards 2023 as the first time that we'd see a rate hike, but I don't agree with that. Okay, next slide. Here's where I'm going to kind of point out where I'm not so concerned about the average life. Is I've The red circle here on the bottom left, this chart's on our website every single month on the PMIA kind of page of reports that we do, and this is our uh, schedule of maturities. Uh, yes, the average life has creeped out to over 300 days, but this part didn't change. It's always been this way where 50% of the PMIA tends to mature within four months. Uh, this is, if you add those up in the bottom, it's like 49.7% of, of the portfolio is going to mature within 120 days. So our investment philosophy never changed uh, as the portfolio has grown. Uh, we do stick to use the barbell approach, and I'll show you a little kind of fun chart here in a minute. And always wait more on the short side within six months because we have a really clear view of the forecast of cash flows. Um, within six months. It's kind of harder to predict past that. As, as you guys all know, things change. And uh, But knowing where we need to pay, take money, it makes it easier for us to be confident with where we're investing the money within six months. And that's kind of why you see uh, I, we're, we're confident that we're going to stay liquid and meet our participants' needs and the state's cash flow needs with how we've invested, even though the average life has crept out. I really think it's just a product of the environment of how large the portfolio has gotten and our barbell strategy. I mean, when we got the $27 billion, believe it or not, in June on top of tax receipts, um, only about $5 billion of that went out past a year. Uh, we really kind of stayed the course and did what we always do and, and keep it here on the short end. 
And we'll go to the next slide. Just the typical things that cross our mind that we have to think about on a daily basis. Yes, we listen to the Fed. Uh, as everyone here is tired of hearing about the drought in California fires, but it does affect what we do. And, uh, you know, we have really tried to help all of you out with your CARES money or any stimulus money that you, you've gotten in terms of depositing it within LAFE. I'll go to the next slide. I'm closing up, wrapping up here, and we'll get it to Christina. Here's our typical barbell strategy. And one more slide, as I'd like to tell you guys, we're very heavily weighted on one side. The poor guy's straining on his right side there on the short end of the investment world, but that's that's kind of how it looks. It hasn't changed. Um, there were some really, really large days in June where you can almost say we did the, the latter approach. We put a little bit across the board, you know, from zero to six months to one year to two years to three. You know, we had to just out of necessity. But really, the overall strategy, what we do just hasn't changed, and we're staying the course. And and again, as I, I like to remind people, if you have questions, feel free to call us, email us. Uh, we love to talk to you and not have to have you worry about it or talk amongst yourselves and uh, create some anxiety. Uh, we're always open to talk to you, even the tough questions. Uh, if we don't have an answer for you, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. We, we, we won't ignore that. And with that, I will close up and pass it over to Christina. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thank you for all of that. Hello, everyone. And I also wanted to thank Doug because he gave me hope about my son moving out of my house. <laughs> He's 30. Uh, <laughs> and one can always use hope in this environment. But uh, first off, I wanted to notate uh, our new kind of, not instead of, but additional web address. It's lace.treasure.ca.gov, just an easier way to find us. Um, and that's available now. Um, if we can move to the next slide. And I know Jeff and Kristen hit on this already, but I thought I'd give you the visual about um, where our balances were. We started off in um, July 2020 at $32 billion, and um, at print, it was $36 billion for August, but um, September was also at 36. And then um, the PMIA down there, it uh, was what, a year ago, about 109, and then um, in September it was 179. And you can see where Jeff was talking about on June 30th where we hit the uh, 193. Uh, it, it was a real difference, but the big thing was is that LAIF went from being nearly 28% of the PMIA to now it's just under 20%. And um, that's all, you know, the COVID dollars and the growth of the the PMIA overall is just huge. Um, and then I went back, and I know Jeff mentioned it, but when I went back and was looking at 2016, it was only the PMIA overall was only like in the 60s, late upper 60s. So it was it's gone up a lot. Can we have the next slide, please? So um, I know Jeff talked about this also. Um, we do have COVID relief funds available. Accounts, some of you have taken advantage of them. We have about 10, so not a lot out of the over 2,000 accounts that we have. It is a separate account from your regular account. It's got a $75 million maximum deposit. Um, and there's the address there, and Jay is the one who can um, handle those accounts. Her phone number's there, and you'll also see her picture towards the end of the presentation. But it's just a, an extra account. It'll help you. You can um, manage the interest separately. I know some of the Fed requires that the interest also be spent on COVID relief. So um, there's that separate accounting process available to you. And um, can we have the next slide? So another administrative detail, I actually got to um, help staff this, um, so like, I don't know, uh, April through June, helping out staff with tracking deposits. And um, one of the things I came across was that people didn't know that after they scheduled a deposit with us, that they actually need to contact their bank and um, schedule with their bank to send us the money. So that was fun. I would call people, and then they would say, I didn't know I knew I had to do that. So um, that's one thing. <laughs> and I also learned that my staff is super picky about my notations. That was interesting. I got in trouble a lot. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then the 
Other things that we learned were that if you schedule your deposit with an effective date, um, that's the date we start paying you interest. So if we don't receive the money, we have to go back and make adjustments so that we can um, not pay you for interest that you didn't actually earn. So um, it's it really important, and my cash management team would also like to hear this, that if you schedule it for an effective date, that we re actually receive your money that date. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. So this is my team. There's me. <laughs> There's Lily in the middle. She's my operations manor, manager. Um, there's Janice. She's our new account, and um, she also takes transactions, of course. She's been with us the longest, um, and she knows everything. There's Jaya. She handles new accounts for bond accounts, and she also handles the COVID accounts. There's Lorian. She's the one, the magnificent one, who put together this whole webinar, and thank you to her for today. And she also handles transactions. And there's Chai. She handles um, transactions, and she also handles account updates. So thank you to Chai. And you would call her if you need to add people or subtract people. Um, if we could have the next slide. So this is our contact information for the office. There's Kristen, Jeff. Tracy and me. That's the phone number that we actually answer. <laughs> and, and hopefully you'll call us because all we've been getting are spam calls. <laughs> Discoverer keeps calling us. Anyway, um, so if we could have the next slide. That brings us to our question and answer period. And I'm going to turn it over to Lily because she's going to moderate our questions. And I've seen a couple of come through. Um, all of us are here to answer it. Jeff, Kristen, Tracy, myself, and Doug, if he's still on, I hope. We will. Um... Yeah, I hope Doug's still on there. Yeah. There we Sorry. go. I don't... So, Lily, if you could go ahead. Okay, I will start with the ones that were submitted during the webinar. And we did receive one from Alan. He asks, do we know what the effect of Zillow selling back the $2.8 billion in the homes they purchased will be? You want me to take a shot at that? Yes, please. I, I, I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I, I read that they're underwater by about 25% of all those purchases. so. Yeah, I I think you can see that they're they're just trying to sell what they have losses on and maybe readjust their thinking of when they go back in. But they, they had a big program to speculate to you know the ultimate fixer upper show uh, seven million excuse me seven thousand homes uh, to to buy and fix up and then rent out and then ultimately sell. So yeah. I guess the comment is that if you saw that chart where real estate's up to these awful high levels, maybe they're seeing the same thing, and yet they still bought properties and, and are will, will incur a loss at these levels. So that'd be my comment that maybe take it as some kind of a sign. Anybody else? Oh, no, I'm not touching that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the next one we have that was submitted during the webinar was from Jeremiah. He asks, will LAFE's interest rates be increasing with the increase in treasury rates? About where will LAFE rates end December 2021, June 2021, June 2022? <laughs> uh, the crystal ball question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, D Doug can help too because Doug and I have these conversations every quarter, and and he yeah. has these awesome spreadsheets and charts he likes to work with, and he's been pretty darn accurate. Um, what I can say is yes, as Treasury rates move, the PMIA will follow. Um, we're not going to be as fast. Um, heck, when it was a sixty billion dollar portfolio, we compared it to a, a you know a, an aircraft carrier. We, we're not going to turn as fast as you know, the smaller boats, the speed boats, or even a, a destroyer, you know, we're, we're going to trail everybody in terms of making that move. Um, but again, the size of the portfolio will allow us to to probably move uh, 
I still think that we can keep up within six months of whatever the, the rates are doing out there. So if the Fed only moves it one time a year, I think we'll be able to kind of stay the course with them and, and follow them in lockstep. So I would just say if you if you listen to the Fed and and you hear that they're moving rates, then know that the PMIA is going to follow that. I, I really don't know. I mean, this is the most um, kind of chaotic kind of stretch I've seen with the Fed meetings and and trying to track and understand where they're going to go and when they're going to do it. But um, we really can't do anything until they do. And we are following. I mean, the market's kind of correcting itself already. It's pricing what they anticipate being a rate hike next year. If you kind of look where rates start to pick up, it's, it looks like the market itself feels like it'll be third quarter ish next year. Um, and, you know, we, those opportunities we get the barbell out, we're picking up some yield that we haven't had in a, a while. But uh, Doug, do you want to add in any commentary on that? Oh, sure. It sounds great, Jeff. I mean, you saved us all with, uh, with LAFE as the rates came down so quickly. So it was just a, it was a wonderful place to be uh, to avoid the, the, the bottom of where we've probably seen rates, hopefully. <laughs> so, yeah, the other side of that is what we're experiencing. So, but um, the great thing is that because the portfolio is so short, you're going to catch up quickly. And I'll never forget, it was, uh, I was in a conference, was it one of those local chapter meetings, the CMTA, it was back in 94, uh, Bill Sherwood was giving it and somebody, and rates were just skyrocketing, right? And so one of the questions was, would LAFE have enough liquidity to meet the redemptions, if you will, for people removing money from LAFE? And very quickly, Bill said exactly what you did, Jeff, and you showed how much liquidity is instantly available um, under those kinds of conditions. So, you know, I don't know if that's, we're going to be a, 90, a 94 coming up here in the next year or so, or, I mean, we don't know, but again, as Jeff was saying, it's... Uh, you know, the Fed has got one heck of a battle with interest rates being forced up by the inflation numbers, and maybe we'll start seeing some even improved employment numbers. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have 20 basis points plus the loan uh, amounts. So whatever the quarter to date uh, amount is for when you look up on LAFE, then add about three basis points for the loans that are out there. So, and I've noticed, Jeff, that you've upticked to 21 basis points on the on the daily. So that's yeah. that's going in the right direction. So it's re it's really funny that you brought up 94. This is to tell you how long Doug and I've been known each other. Um, I have a 1994 portfolio right here, and you want Doug, you, you want to guess what the PMI balance was in 94? Oh God! <laughs> Twenty six <laughs> billion oh <my> dollars. <laughs> Wow. So, yeah, it's come a long way. <laughs> yeah, in seven, well, 27 years, it's changed a lot. So that's remarkable. Wow, it's a lot of money. And your pay's gone up commensurate with that gain, right? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> but uh, all right, I, I, Lily, I don't. <laughs> what was the reason for the decrease in late total value in July of 2021? Oh, from June to July. Yeah, that's normal uh, early year cash flow. I can actually defer to Kristen on that. She has a much better background knowledge on, on how that works. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of uh, payments that go out in July. So that would definitely affect the balances, payments for healthcare and occurs, retirement um, funds. So that's the primary cost of what happens in July. It's very volatile for us and also why we have to be very careful about how we position ourselves and the money we take in July. So that's the primary reason. And, and to kind of support that theory, if you go back years ago, um, we used to have to get revenue anticipation notes every year to get us the cash flow to balance out the cash flow. Um, way more goes out at the beginning of our fiscal year and way more comes in at the end of the fiscal year. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of just a, a snapshot of what you're seeing. I mean, like I was showing fiscal year end the portfolio was 193 billion, and now as of October 30th, it's in the mid 170s. So it looks like we've lost 20 billion dollars, but it's more just the normal flow of that money and how it's gonna it's gonna go. It's a lot larger. I mean, everything's larger now in what we do. There's way more cash that comes in every day, way more cash that goes out, and we live in the world where there's a net. Whatever's left over is what we're investing for everybody. So. I think was that it, Lily? I have a few that were submitted during registration. Okay. Is 
next one is, is there a difference between PMIA and LAFE performance? Well, no, <laughs> the, the LAFE performance is based on what the PMIA does. Um, there will be, uh, in terms of the earnings, that's how uh, the, our office is, is kind of compensated for the work that goes into it. Uh, we don't charge fees to the participants of LAFE or even Smith, the, the fees come out of the earnings. Um, so they, they're in lockstep together. It just depends on um, what those fees end up being. What's interesting now is the outside loans have more than paid for those fees where you're still earning. LAFE's getting paid more than what the PMIA actually earns because of the outside loans that have been attached to it. So, um, But they're always going to be in lockstep. The LAFE earnings is based on what the PMIA does. So it's it's one and the same, but very small amount different. <laughs> yeah. The commingle fund. We invest the money. The money we see is colorless. Just we're told they're now every morning. Yep. So we don't have like a separate pot and that's just for late versus the rest of the critique. Okay, one last one. It's do you think inflation will max out at five and a half percent or will it go higher and for how long? Oh good, Doug didn't hang up yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great question. Well if Look at this way. If Bloomberg consensus is correct, uh, then next week we'll find the October to October, you know, year on year number, and it's projected to be 5.8. So um, I guess that would kind of beat you beat the number you're looking at, and and that's with a half a percent increase just in the month alone. So if you annualize that, that's six percent. But then you look at some of these. Uh, uh, Annabelle, uh, UPS, I just got a message. They're going to raise prices 5.9%. So that's real close to six. Next day after Christmas, uh, they're kind enough to wait till then. Um, gosh, it was uh, Mandalese, which has, uh, if you like Ritz cracker crackers, go buy them today because they're going to go up 6% next year. Uh, so you're, you're going to start seeing, and it's going to be very interesting. It's a great question because what if we change our, Outlook, and we've had decades and decades of waiting for lower prices, essentially, uh, or at least stable prices. So what if it just gets in everybody's psyche that you better hurry up and hoard today because it's going to be more expensive tomorrow? And so, you know, the numbers we're getting out of uh, out of the government is, you know, they're backward looking, right? So, but if corporations start to apply what's currently being stated and individuals demand more and more wages, which is looking that way, right? Um, you know, maybe maybe this 5.8 is just the start. I I don't know. And like Jeff was saying, let's let's hope we get that 1% Fed funds by this time next year because that would really be wonderful for the pool rate. Yeah, uh, I'll add a question. I'll, I'll follow that for you, Doug. What I've been thinking about this is, um, do you think a lot of the inflation is is it more? Uh, what are they calling it? The, the transportation of the products, getting it out to everybody. We got all these ships, you know, with every, all the products sitting there out and waiting to be unloaded. Or is it still a production problem or is it a combination of the two? I mean, I, I, I tend, I've i for years at these conferences said we've gotten so efficient that if we need something that's made so quickly that it would be really hard to see inflation, you know, take effect on that side. But clearly I was wrong because here we are. So Yeah, no, it's, it's a great point. It really, it's uh, all these things have come in together with uh, the slowdown of the whole global supply chain. And then, you know, everybody's just has plenty of money to go out there and spend and buy things and all that pent up demand that's coming out. But it is very interesting when you look, there's a chart that I saw the other day in the components of stuff. So there's very few things that are even fully assembled here in the United States that don't rely on suppliers from all over the world, you know, to, to have those, things into that product. The other thing I just read recently was, uh, you know, we've been ordering from China a lot of products, of course, um, but China is, here, here's a number, 12% of their cost for final product is labor. Our cost for final product in the United States is three times that amount. So the article I was reading suggested that as China wants to bring more, you know, people more into the higher median income levels, that that's their, they want to put pressure on those rising prices. So it'll be interesting if, if their labor costs go up as that's reflected even on the final product that we're buying here, let alone our, our labor market here, which is, um, you know, 
in short supply of uh, you know the, the bottom part of labor but uh, yeah and if you're social security um some of us guys are coming up on that that you're going to get you know 5.9 percent raise and and then maybe for everyone that's what's working says well, wait a minute i don't want my three percent raise i want a five percent raise and you look at the quits rate uh you know this this jobless this job data people could quit very easily and go find another job so it's yeah all that it makes you think the fed's got a big big job to do uh um, yeah sure they don't want to raise rates uh and and break the asset bubble so but they're gonna have a challenge next year i would think so maybe that's enough said thank you everybody willie did you have any more questions No, no more questions. That was it. All right. Well, at this time, that'll be the end. Thank you um, to our keynote speaker, Treasurer Ma, and thank you to Doug for spending their time with us today. Um, and thank you all for participating. And this will be up on the web. Thank Thanks. you, Tina. Great job. Thank you, everybody. Bye.